And what is uh, BGTA? It's called pre-implantational genetic testing for aneuploidies. Uh, this is a genetic test uh, that is performed on the embryos during an IVF treatment before they are implanted in the maternal womb. Uh, this genetic test allows to detect uh, abnormalities on the number of chromosomes of these embryos. So we can uh, select for transfer only the embryos that are chromosomally normal, what we call euploid. So why we should that or why uh, we need to do that? Because by screening these uh, embryos, by diagnosing these embryos for the chromosomal aneuploidies, the chromosomal abnormalities, we can help the couples to increase pregnancy rate, decrease miscarriage rate. Also, we can reduce or we reduce the risk of having a baby with a chromosomal uh, syndrome, like Down syndrome, and we are reducing uh, the time to pregnancy since we start IVF until we, uh, the, the, we get pregnant. So what are chromosomes? Chromosomes are uh, this uh, structure uh, we have here in this picture. This picture is called karyotype, okay? And the chromosomes are our DNA containing our genes, okay? During the cell division, simply the DNA, it's very it's, uh, extremely compact and it's forming this uh, structure called chromosomes. But the chromosomes is our DNA with uh, our genes on there. We have uh, 46, chromosomes that are organized in pairs. So we have 23 pairs. Uh, from each pair, we, inher we inherit one chromosome from our mother and one chromosome from uh, our father. And the main difference in the karyotype of uh, male and female is that uh, female will have two chromosome X, while male they have one chromosome X and one chromosome Y. So uh, the embryos, uh, when we're analyzing them, we can find that they have a normal chromosomal complement uh, like this with 46 uh, chromosomes, but we can also detect embryos when a, with an abnormal number of chromosomes, what we call uh, with an euploid disorder, an euploid embryo. It can happen that these embryos, uh, they have uh, missing uh, chromosomes that we call monosomy. For example, a monosomy of chromosome 13, it's mi meaning that this embryo, instead of having two chromosomes 13, it's only having one. Or we can have extra chromosomes, what we call trisomy. So instead of having, for example, two chromosomes 13, if the embryo has three, then it's an uh, uh, embryo with trisomy for uh, 13. Also, these aneuploidies can be classified according if they are uh, compatible with life or not. Very few of these aneuploidies uh, can survive cell birth. Okay, the most well known is the trisomy 21 that is related to Down syndrome. Uh, the majority of these aneuploidies uh, are not compatible with life, so usually are giving or no pregnancy at all or a miscarriage. So, as I told you, most of the embryos and, and fetus cannot survive with missing or extra chromosomes. And uh, this is related to IVF failure uh, and to spontaneous miscarriage. However, some uh, of these abnormalities can survive uh, until birth, uh, leading to a baby affected of a genetic syndrome. As I told you, for example, here we have the karyotype of a, a trisomy 21 that is three chromosome 21 uh, that is causing uh, Down syndrome. So by testing the embryos in an IVF cycle, we can discard the embryos with chromosomal abnormality and select the embryos with a normal uh, number of chromosomes that we have a higher potential to implant and to give uh, an ongoing pregnancy and a healthy baby. And how we do that? We need uh, to perform, obviously, an in vitro fertilization cycle in order to obtain uh, the embryos, okay? Uh, then we need to do an embryo biopsy, meaning to take a small uh, sample from these embryos uh, to uh, be analyzed for uh, genetics. Uh, this biopsy uh, can be done in day three of embryo development when we have an embryo typically in eight cells, 
or in day five of embryo development that we have uh, what we call blastocyst stage. Okay, uh, usually there is a tendency on do the biopsy on day five, but a, a lot of clinics still they are doing in day three. Okay, so by making a hole in this uh, zona, in the zona pellucida, and then we are taking, uh, in that case, one cell, and here we take uh, five to ten cells. These uh, cells, okay, are sent to the laboratory, the samples are sent to the laboratory for the genetic analysis. What is important is mm, that the embryos are not going out of the IVF lab. The embryos are kept in the lab. Usually mm, they, are, they are frozen and keep frozen since the genetic test sometimes takes um, some days to, to, to get the results, especially if the, the genetic laboratory is not in our uh, clinic or we have to, to ship the, the samples to other city or to other countries. So usually the embryos are frozen and then the genetic laboratory is analyzing the samples we send. When the genetic uh, lab is giving us the results, then uh, the clinic, the IVF clinic, is, uh, all, is, is only throwing the embryos that are normal with normal, norm, normal number of chromosomes and these embryos are transferred. So I have uh, here a video of how the mm, let's see how it works, how a biopsy on blastocyst is done. Okay, working. Okay, this is the blastocyst, and uh, this is the needle where. The hole in the zona is done by a laser that is making a small hole, and then we will take the sample from the embryos from this hole. Here with this, this is the laser make a hole, it was difficult to see. Now we are going in, aspirating some of the cells. And then we have to cut the cells also with the laser. This is the laser. It's not very clear, maybe in the video, but here we are shooting, shooting with the laser the cells. Okay, and the final probably cut to separate the embryo. And these are the cells we are going to analyze. So here we have the cells that we are going to put in a tube and going to send to the laboratory. Okay, let's go back here. Okay, so when we have uh, the sample, we are going to send from each embryo one sample. Obviously, they cannot be mixed. It's very important. We have to have the samples uh, perfectly identified. Okay, then we are sending these samples to the genetic uh, laboratory where they are processing these samples and uh, mm, uh, analyzing the, the, the results. Uh, there are different technologies that we can use to analyze uh, these embryos to check for an neoploidus, but uh, nowadays the, the more it's widely used is the what we call next generation sequencing NGS. This is a type of technology that can allow to detect an neoploidus of the whole chromosome set. So uh, these are the, the results that we can obtain, the profiles we can obtain from, from this machine here. 
Okay, in that case, this profile uh, corresponds to an uh, embryo that is a uh, normal female. Okay, we have, and it will correspond to this karyotype. Here, we have a profile that will correspond to an embryo that is a uh, normal uh, male, chromosome Y. And here we have the profile of an embryo with three chromosome uh, 21. It's a female, and we have here this peak that is corresponding to the extra chromosome 21. So by doing that, then the laboratory is, is sending the report to the IVF clinic. And based on these results, uh, the clinic is transferring only the embryo that we say that are uh, chromosomally normal. These embryos, I repeat, they are having more chances uh, of uh, achieving pregnancy uh, a term, uh, and arrive to, to term and give uh, a baby free of this um, chromosomal syndrome we talked before, okay? Uh, there are uh, a specific group of patients that we know in advance that they are at higher risk of making embryos with aneuploidies, okay? The most well-known uh, group of patients is what we call advanced maternal age patients that are women over 37. It's well known that when maternal age increases, the quality of the eggs uh, is decreased, okay? And this bad quality of the eggs is making that these eggs, they are having a lot of abnormalities in their chromosomes, okay? Extra or missing chromosomes that after, after fertilization will give us embryos with a chromosomal abnormalities. So if we see in this chart here, we have that as the age of the patient increases, the percentage of embryos with chromosomal abnormalities in an IVF cycle also increases and, and, and can be as high as around 90% in patients of uh, 30, 43, 44 years old. So in that patients, around 90% of the embryos are chromosomally abnormal. So in that case, this reduces a lot the chances of finding a normal embryo that can uh, implant. So uh, as I told you, with aging, uh, the chromosomes in the eggs uh, are less likely to divide properly, uh, leading to eggs having extra or missing chromosomes that after fertilization will give us uh, abnormal embryos. For example, if we have here the egg, here the sperm, and both normal, after fertilization, they will give a normal embryo with 46 uh, chromosomes. On the contrary, we have that the, for example, this is the egg, it's having, uh, instead of one chromosome 21, it's having two. After the fertilization with the normal sperm, we will have an embryo with three chromosomes 21 that is related to Down syndrome. And for, uh, on the other hand, if the, if the embryo is nullisomic for chromosome 21, meaning there is no, uh, no chromosome 21 in this egg, after fertilization, we will have a monosomy on chromosome 21. I, I, I'm talking about chromosome 21, but this can happen uh, with any of the chromosomes and sometimes not happen only in one. The abnormalities uh, can affect different chromosomes in the same embryo. So we can have a trisomy of 21 plus monosomy 13 plus a trisomy of chromosome 1. Okay. Another group, group of patients that can have a higher uh, number of uh, embryos with chromosomal abnormalities are patients that uh, suffer from recurrent IVF failure, failures or recurrent pregnancy losses. Obviously, there are a lot of other causes uh, for that, okay, like uterine abnormalities, autoimmune disorders, uh, etc. Uh, usually, the doctor in the clinic, if you are affected of, of, of this, of IVF failures or recurrent pregnancy losses, uh, the doctor will recommend or will do the, the, the most suitable test in your case to rule out uh, the other abnormalities, okay? But sometimes we cannot found, uh, found the, the cause of this, and we can never discard that it's because the embryos we are uh, producing, the couple is producing, uh, uh, are aneuploid embryos, are abnormal embryos, okay? So it, it, in the, these two groups of patients, uh, offering um, PGTA can be an option in order, especially to in, in this with recurrent pregnancy losses, 
to reduce the spontaneous uh, abortion and uh, an increase uh, their chances of getting pregnant and most important to reduce uh, the time to pregnancy by uh, reducing the number of spontaneous abortions they can they can have the third main group of patients that uh, can benefit from PCPA are patients are couples affected of male factor. It's well known that uh, abnormal sperm parameters uh, correlates with a poor fertilization rate and poor develop, uh, embryo development. Uh, there is an increase in this, in this group of patients of, of recurrent pregnancy losses. Also, uh, there is abnormalities in the DNA of this sperm that we can detect by analyzing the, the sperm DNA fragmentation. And also we can see higher aneuploid rate in this sperm, meaning this sperm are having uh, extra or missing chromosomes that uh, after fertilization will uh, give an embryo with also abnormality. Uh, so by offering PGTA to these uh, patients, uh, it's a good option to select uh, the normal embryos because they have um, a high risk of producing abnormal ones. And there is evidence that uh, here they compare uh, a control population that did an IVF with PGTA, okay, with uh, the, study, the study group that did uh, a population with a uh, male factor with abnormal sperm parameters, and they saw that in the control population, the rate of uh, embryos that are abnormal with chromosomal abnormalities it is lower than in the study population. So clearly, there is evidence that these patients uh, with with different kind of abnormal uh, sperm parameters, but also with uh, oligospermia. Uh, they are producing more abnormal embryos. So to summarize a, bit, a little bit, uh, we see that there are groups of patients at higher risk of producing uh, chromosomally abnormal embryos during an IVF cycle, okay? And these patients uh, can benefit from PGTA. So it's important also a very good selection of the patients uh, that can benefit for this test. So by selecting the embryos for transfer, selecting the, the normal ones with uh, 46 uh, chromosomes, we select the ones that are having a higher potential to implant and survive uh, in term. okay? Doing that, we can increase the pregnancy rate, and we decrease the miscarriage rate, we are reducing the risk of having a baby with a chromosomal syndrome like Down syndrome, and we are reducing uh, the time to pregnancy. Okay, it's important also to, to remark that this PGTA uh, doesn't not improve the cumulative pregnancy rate, but reduces the time to pregnancy and the miscarriage rate. So uh, a trial and error approach, meaning not doing PGT, so can be uh, ethical and the ethical controversial, okay? Meaning, for example, an exam a very clear example of that, if we have a couple that we can classify them as at high risk of having uh, abnormal embryos because he is uh, 39 and he's having a very poor uh, quality of the sample. So a priori, uh, they are at high risk of, of producing embryos with chromosomal abnormalities. And they uh, do an IVF and they have 10 embryos, but um, from these 10 embryos, we have only one normal and nine are uh, chromosomally abnormal. But the couple, they don't want to do PGTA for any reason, they don't want to do. So, uh, okay, there is another option, uh, transfer one by one, okay, do transfer of all 10 embryos. Mm. One, one embryo per transfer. Okay, if the couple is lucky and in the first uh, embryo transfer, we transfer the one that is normal and with more chances of, of implant and this embryo is implanting and, and they have a baby. Okay, mm, so in that case, they were very lucky, but can happen that maybe we choose for transfer this embryo, uh, the embryo number 10. So they have to do nine embryo transfers before 
okay, most of these uh, abnormal embryos that we are transferring, maybe they are not implanting and there is an idea of failure, but some of them can implant and give them carriers, okay? So uh, by doing that, this trial and an error approach, um, we are spending a lot of long time, long time also with the psychological uh, burden of the miscarriage that we can have. Okay. For the reason I think it's important that uh, by selecting uh, the embryos in when you are doing an IVF, uh, you can reduce this. This explains how you can reduce the time to pregnancy and how you can decrease the miscarriage. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaman. So with that, I would request Dr. Gautam. Good evening. My talk today is on IUI or intrauterine insemination, which is the first line infertility intervention and is the most performed infertility intervention uh, across the world. In the year 2015, a Singapore based research organization had done a market survey in India only on the Indian subcontinent and uh, over 1 million. IUIs were done in one calendar year from the Indian subcontinent alone. This is way back in 2015. And uh, this uh, seminar is not for doctors, it's for basically patients. So I will uh, talk in a layman's language, go very slowly and try to make you understand that IUI is not a magical therapy. It is the first line intervention with very low success rates. So what is IUI? IUI is the therapeutic introduction of capacitated sperms in the upper uterine cavity. So when a man in a man's ejaculate, there are good, bad and ugly sperms, not so good sperms. In IUI, we select only the top quality sperms, the very good sperms. So if the total sperms are say 40 million per ml and the top quality sperms are just 5 million per ml, we harvest those 5 million per ml sperms and make them undergo a reaction called capacitation. Capacitation means we make them imminently fertilizable. That means after this reaction, if they come across an egg, there is greater chances of that sperm fertilizing the egg. Normally, capacitation begins in the cervical crib. Cervix is the mouth of the uterus. Cervical cribs are spaces where the sperm, the ejaculated sperms from the vagina go up and are stored in the cervical cribs for up to 72 hours. And we, uh, capacitate these sperms outside in the laboratory, make them imminently fertilizable and deposit them via a fine silicone tube in the upper uterine cavity. All the patients must know that fertilization takes place in the fallopian tubes. So each, whenever each month an egg is released, it is picked up by the fallopian tube and lies waiting for the sperm. The sperm has to make its way from the vagina to the cervical crypts from the cervical crypts to the upper uterine cavity, from the upper uterine cavity via the internal tubal ostia to the fallopian tubes, where a single lucky sperm fertilizes with the egg. The embryo is formed in the tube 
and five days it takes for this embryo to move down from the tube back to the uterus and implant. So when we do an IUI, we start initiate the process of capacitation and put only the top quality sperms in the upper uterine cavity. What we do with IUI is we just mimic the function of the human cervix. So what are the functions of the human cervix? The cervical secretions nourish or keep the sperms alive. The cervical, the human cervix acts like a physiological filter and removes the dead cells, the debris and the you know, vaginal cells. So exactly with IUI, we filter out all these abnormal things that have no place in the upper uterine cavity. I've explained to you what is capacitation and storage. The sperms are stored in the human cervix for up to 72 hours and are thrown up into the upper uterine cavity with via asynchronous waves. So we capacitate the sperms outside and deposit the capacitated sperms in the upper uterine cavity. So once again, you have to understand, we just carry out or mimic the cervical function in the laboratory. We get rid of the debris, the abnormal sperm, the seminal plasma. We pick up the very small fraction of the top quality sperm, motile sperms and in vitro means outside the body. In the IVF lab or the IUI lab, we start the process of capacitation and make the sperms imminently fertilizable. What are the common indications of IUI? The common indications of IUI are unexplained infertility, commonest, when you don't find any abnormality, the HSG is normal, the husband's count is normal, the hormones are normal, pelvis is clean. So we try to put in sperms in the upper uterine cavity closer to the site of fertilization, hoping there will be easier fertilization and the patient will get pregnant. Cervical infertility, where you have undergone cervical cauterization or some sur surgery on the cervix. So the cervical secretions are affected, there are, the cervical crypts are damaged. So we bypass the cervix and put the sperms in the upper uterine cavity. You could have oligoesthenozoospermia, that means oligospermia is low count, asthenozoospermia is low motility. Retrograde ejaculation is commonly seen after, say, prostatic surgeries and the man, instead of ejaculating outside, ejaculates into the urinary bladder. Such sperm can also be recovered, processed, capacitated and put in the upper uterine cavity. There are other indications. So almost for all indications, except for tubal factor, when tubes are blocked, you cannot do an IUI. Also, when you get multiple IVF failures, sometimes we go back because simply the patient cannot afford uh, IVF and we go back to doing IUIs and occasionally have success. What are the contraindications? When should IUI not be done? Any form of acute genital infection, any tubal factor, any unhealthy tubes, a relative contraindication is hyperstimulated ovaries. That means in... Uh, in a developed world, like in, for example, in Dubai, if you stimulate a patient and she has more than three follicles, we cannot do an IUI. This is simply to prevent multiple pregnancies. Multiple pregnancies are considered a complication of assisted reproduction. Medical, psychological, and social indications are also there. Sample collection is the first part. It's by masturbation. Ideally, the wife or partner must go in and collect the ejaculate in two parts. Always remember, only the first, the first ejaculate, the first spurt from the man contains 90% of the sperms. The second, third, fourth spurts that the man ejaculates contains only the glandular secretions of accessory glands like prostate and other glands. So we have... If the wife is instructed and the containers are labeled one and two, then the sperms are only in the first spurt and it's easier for the embryologist or the lab technician to separate the sperm, especially in 2021 when we are moving 
to simpler techniques like nanotechnology used for processing spots. There are occasional problems for like viscous sample, which has not, you know, we deal with more of this with the doctors. Pooled ejaculates when uh, Nan has a very low count and he cannot afford IVF, we ask him, we start collecting sample in the morning at eight o'clock, ask him to come in at one o'clock, ask him to give another sample. And if possible, if he can ejaculate again in the evening at six o'clock, then we pull the ejaculates and process it to give him a chance of a better chance of having a better sample for IUI and getting pregnant. This is currently what we are doing in 2021. Previously, there were only swim up methods and density gradient separation methods. Today, you have microfluidic sperm sorting chips. So where you just put a drop of sperm and the good quality sperms travel along these microfluidic channels and you can aspirate them. The immotile sperm and the debris are filtered out through these channels. So it's a no centrifugation method which is preferred when you do an IUI. So this is a paper again for medical professionals in September 2019 where they compared density gradient separation traditionally which was done over the last 30-40 years to microfluid sperm sorting and which had a much higher pregnancy rate. Again, uh, these are rough rules of the thumb on when IUI is more useful. And when the total progressive motile sperm count is at least 5 million, then you are going to have a positive pregnancy result more frequently. This is how the sperms look like post-processing. All the debris is removed, the epithelial cells are removed, and this is a clean sample. And you can see how nicely the sperms move post-processing. And such a sample is put up in the uterus for an IUI. When do you do an IUI? So generally, if you are doing only one IUI, uh, you do it 40 hours after the HCG trigger. And if you are doing two IUIs, you do it 24 and 40 hours after the HCG trigger. I personally prefer two IUIs, one before and one after ovulation. But if cost is an issue and the patient can afford only one IUI, then I would prefer to do it once 40 hours after the HCG trigger. And this is a 2014 study that shows that whenever you use clomiphene as compared to gonadotropin, the trigger should not be given at 18 millimeters. Trigger should be given after the follicle crosses 22 millimeters. And Japneet and Vishnu have told you all that do not raise hands. Whatever questions you have, put it in the question and answer box. Only those will be answered. And again, Endometrial thickness has very less prediction about ongoing pregnancy achievement in IUI cycles. These are papers, one from 2019, one from 1992. Both of them say that uh, pregnancy rates with IUI increase with two inseminations as compared to a single insemination. This is a very old paper from Canada, but from Vancouver, Canada but from 1994, but it is true even today. And a cost benefit analysis shows that three cycles of IUI are superior to IVF for Zift and comparable to GIFT and four cycles of IUI are theoretically superior to all techniques. So there must be some of the, there must be reasons why IUI is not done alone. IUI is always done in conjunction with injections, with fertility injections, because Giving these fertility injections to produce multiple eggs is called superovulation and it corrects subtle ovulatory disorders. It makes the ovarian size large and brings the ovary in close proximity to the fimbria. Superovulation may affect tubal vascularity. Swim up techniques enhance fertilizing capacity of sperms. And IUI increases the number of sperms reaching the ampuloisthmic junction. When is IUI not beneficial? After the age of 38 years, 38 to 40 years, I believe after 38 years, IUI does not give us good chances of getting pregnant. Maximum of three cycles of IUI should be done before moving on to IVF. Treatment with gonadotropins and IUI gives you a maximum success rate of between 25 to 30%. 
And when you compare this with the 70 to 80 percent success rate with IVF, it is a big difference. Again, there was a phase five years ago where letrozole was pushed as the magic drug. So this is a study published in 2013 from All India Institute, New Delhi, and this found no superiority of letrozole over clomiphene. We still consider clomiphene as the first line of treatment. Again, we get patients referred to us in our tertiary clinic where IUIs have been done 12, 13, 14 times. Please do not repeat IUI more than three times if done using gonadotropins. And whether bed rest is required, extended bed rest is not required. You have scientific studies that prove that immobilizing for more than 15 minutes does not add to the pregnancy rates. And once you process the sample, there should be a maximum of 60 minute limit of the interval after you wash and process the sperm to the IUI. Like with any medical procedure, IUI can have very terrible complications. So the only thing to be careful of is where is the sample processed? The sample has to be processed under a laminar flow in a good lab. You cannot process IUI samples in your nursing home or in the side room or the kitchen. And if you read literature, there are complications cited of peritoneal pus collections and salpingitis and permanent damage of the tubes by introducing infection via IUI into a virginal pelvis. On the other hand, there are reports that sperm are very hardy creature and for doctors this is a must read a report from 1994. This man completed his family of two children with IUI with sperm retrieved from the rectum. He had a urethrorectal fistula, a connection between the rectum and the urethra, male urethra and they would retrieve sperm and do a three times a sperm wash and uh, in antibiotic supplemented media and then do an IUI and he could complete his family. So it's an interesting thing for medical professionals. What are the take home messages for IUI success? When you do IUI, you do not inseminate over 0.5 ml of processed sperm. Use a very soft catheter and the softer the catheter, the better the results. The IUI procedure must be finished within two minutes maximum time. You do not hurry up and push it in in five seconds. You do it slowly over one to two minutes and slowly inject the 0.5 ml. So it's really slow. Ideally, one must do the IUI on a partially full bladder with transabdominal sonography guidance, at least in the first 100 cases I tell my students for doing ideal IUIs. And if there is blood inside or outside the IUI catheter after you finish or on your panties later, the chances of pregnancy go down. So this was a short wrap and take home uh, lecture on uh, IUI. And we will now take the questions from our audience. And the first question.